Wow, good morning everyone. It's uh, quite an experience to be here. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about experiences. It seems that we learn a great deal from our experiences. You know, from getting our hands dirty, getting involved, trial and error. And it's through these experiences that we reach what I like to call a moment of clarity, where everything just sort of clicks and you go, oh, I get this. I know exactly what to do now. And you can take that information and you can apply it to different areas, like over here, and over here, and over here. Now one of my moments of clarity that I like to reflect upon really taught me about how education works. Grade 11, ancient civilizations class. We're sitting talking about the fall of the Roman Empire through um, a game role-playing type of activity. And I, in all my teenage glory, was given the leader of the mighty Visigoths. And our goal, to sack the city of Rome. Now, I failed in this endeavor quite miserably, actually. But this lesson taught me a very valuable thing. And that was on one hand, I could sit there and listen to the teacher drone on and on and be bored out of my mind, or read a textbook that had nothing to do about anything with just a lot of the large words and I'd probably end up falling asleep in it. Or I could step into what I was learning. I could become involved, get my hands dirty, and I could gain my understanding through experiencing the information. Yeah. Come a little closer. Oh. You're out of the line. Oh, sorry. Nice. Uh, my experience, uh, my aha moment, if you will, um, was actually in high school as well, and it was in ancient civilizations class as well. Um, but it was one of those moments where everybody did fall asleep. The teacher put on a movie. Now, the movie was a series called Connections by James Burke, and if anybody knows it, you're going to start laughing and nodding. Uh, but here's this British presenter who takes history and science out of the textbook and, and shows you where it happened and shows you how it connects to everything we do. And that was my aha moment. It's a knock-on effect. And everything is based on everything else. It's not just linear, it's ripples. And I started to see those connections. And I wanted to know more. So I wanted to watch the YouTube videos. And I wanted to uh, see his website. And I wanted to go and see how it looked on the computer. And then I realized it was 1990. And I was stuck reading the books and waiting for reruns on TV Ontario. Um, <laughs> But it never stopped me from wanting to see this type of connection and how it worked and see how everything interrelates. As educators and teachers, we want to try and bring in the real world as much as possible. Okay? We create these massive units that span the seas of curriculum while also talking about these learning skills that we think that students need to have. So what we did is incorporate that into this game as much as possible. We tore down the walls of our classroom as much as was structurally safe. And we brought in the outside world so that students could actually experience the connection between these subjects. They could practice these learning skills. They could practice collaboration, critical thinking, and problem solving so that they were more prepared when they left the classroom. Now, as some of you have already been talking about, and that's nice that it, it, this works so well together, is that we've been watching the whole gamification and bringing games into the classroom and, and seeing how that works and seeing how kids get skills from that, and we, we love that. We're still teachers and we still have a curriculum, so when we built the game, we designed it with the uh, political geography as the backbone. And we wanted to use that to continue to build skills. Yes, names and dates and places are, are part of it, but we also wanted the things like exploration and creation. So when we designed our game, this, we were focused more on the skills. Things like uh, classifying, and we did that by giving them resources that they had to classify and sort. Um, we went through the process of gathering data and collecting and organizing uh, ideas and, and, and gathering data from doing rolls with dice. Um, also communication, talking to each other, and we do that through trade. They spend time evaluating their decisions and, and, and sorting out how to, where their options are, and most importantly, and this is something we do at the end of each round, is a reflection on what they've done and where they're going to be going. So let's get down to basics. The game is called the League of Regions. And we started off by um, figuring out that we could get students involved by creating a role-playing um, simulation type game that students engage in throughout the entire year. So we started by taking the world and we split it up into eight regions. Okay? We, didn't we didn't include North America because we wanted to give students a different perspective on the world. So within these regions, students get into groups. The black and within hole. This <laughs> Within these groups, students take on different minister jobs. So we have the prime minister, 
the health minister, education minister, economic minister, and environmental ministers. Each student stays in their minister role for about four terms, or for four weeks, upon which they switch minister jobs, so they get a different perspective of the world. Okay? Now, we wanted to teach students as well that money is not the be-all and end-all of life. It's a concept even some of us tend to struggle with. So, but we needed a currency in our game. So we decided to make knowledge that currency. Students can acquire knowledge cards or knowledge tokens through completing various tasks throughout the week or throughout the day. These could be anything from daily math questions to problem solving or critical thinking trivia questions. Okay? Now these trivia or this um, knowledge cards not only serve as a currency, but it also teaches students to collaborate with each other, to work together to get them. And it's also for motivation. Because I'm going to try and get my region to have more knowledge than his so that I can become more advanced. All right. We use this knowledge uh, as a currency, but we also use in the regions, um, they get resources. And we made the resources accurate to the regions that they're in. Um, so it is more realistic. They use the resources and their currency of knowledge to purchase things, things like items and technology. Now the items are things like books, um, seeds, uh, medicine, but also paying off currency or paying off uh, salaries like workers, doctors, and teachers, something that every society does. Um, the technology, however, we designed it a little bit different. We created this technology pyramid. And through this technology pyramid, you start here down at the bottom, and you start, they, every region starts with nothing. And through their, or their knowledge and their resources, they have to acquire things like laws or pottery or the bronze works. And then as they advance and get more knowledge and get more resources, they can move up to where they get penicillin, plastics, nuclear fusion, or space travel. Now we wanted to create a checks and balance system within our game so that students understand that not everything in life is guaranteed. Okay? And how we did that was we brought in disease and disaster, which students roll for each turn. Now the more severe your disease, obviously the more your region stands to lose. So if your region has a common cold or a tropical storm, you don't stand to lose as much as if you're being wiped out by the Spanish flu or being pummeled by asteroids from space. Okay? So there's a big difference between the two. Now not only do disease and disaster help limit for tech and items, it also helps towards population. Now yes, we've included population because students need to understand there's a very specific balance. You need to have enough food to feed your people. You need to have enough clean water for them. And they need to be happy. Because if they're not getting fed, they don't have clean water, and they're unhappy because they have the Spanish flu and they're getting hit by asteroids, your people are going to be pretty upset with you as a government. Okay? And you're going to find yourself in a revolt. And if history's taught us anything, it's that revolts suck to be in. Okay? Now, at the end of each turn, students complete a series of questions from their minister folders. These questions relate the real world to the minister role. Okay? So the prime minister may find himself dealing with issues like freedom of religion, freedom of speech, or the relationship between First Nations people and the government. Okay? It's these questions that teach students that their jobs are very real and the issues relate to real people in the real world. So it makes the game much more of a real experience for them. So here you can sort of see students working away at their folders um, as the game is going on. Really, we've given them no opportunity to sit there and do absolutely nothing. They always have something to do while we're playing the game. We're moving around, no one's being idle. Obviously, this game is about social justice. The whole idea is that we want to balance um, what you're learning in the game, but also seeing what it's like in the real world. And we did that through the resources and through the technology pyramid. The resources are accurate for the regions. So some regions don't have certain resources. Mm -hmm. And nobody has all of the resources. So to be able to be successful in the tech pyramid, you have to figure out ways to, to work through that. Our assignments are like that as well. We have assignments based on the regional uh, teams, and they get less resources than others to complete the exact same task, and they have to go through that. There's inequality. It's a reality. But it's down to whether or not you can persevere or you come up a way, with a way of solving your problems. One of our ways of solving it is through trade. Now, because it's resources and there are cards that they're dealing with, with resources and knowledge, it becomes true reciprocity that they are trading resource for resource. 
and the trade floor is an interesting place. It's the New York Stock Exchange all over again. It is. It can be entertaining sometimes. Um, as they get go on, they are more desperate for certain things because they want to advance, and that's the nice thing. Now, our job in all of this is not as a referee. We're a facilitator. We've started the game, we've started it in motion, and then they take over. We don't step in unless we absolutely have to. The great thing about this game is you can use as much of it or as little of it as you want. So what happens in Doug's room is very different than what happens in mine. It's the exact same game, two different versions. And we relate these versions to the students in your class and your teaching styles as well. Okay, but there's very different extension pieces that you can add to it as you go along. One of which that we're experimenting with is the model UN. So where you'd have uh, ministers who are the, the students who are in the prime minister role, they actually create international policy that takes effect within the game. So this teaches students that they have ownership over this game as much as we do. It's not a framework that they have to exist with inside of it. It's something that they can manipulate as they go. They can experience the game. We've had several people come in to watch the game since we started running it. And a lot of teachers or uh, resource teachers or people from the board have popped in. And we tend to get two specific questions. Do the students realize that they're learning? No, and I don't plan to tell them. <laughs> and this and, is a lot. Yeah. Do they actually get this? Yeah, of course they do. This is a generation of gamers. This is a generation of multiplayer, connected, role-playing game individuals. They're used to this type of thing. If anything, this game slows it down for them. The difference with our game is you make a decision, you have to live with it. There's no reset. You don't get to go back. You have to deal with those kind of consequences. But that also brings in the brilliance of the game as well. It's a game built or designed by us but it's really formed and built by them. They take it over and they do what they want with it. And isn't that what we really want? Thank you. <laughs>